shall we discuss the New Zealand mosque massacre? Well, I have a bunch of clips, so I guess we must. Yes, before we jump into clips, uh, and I knew and I knew you would have clips, and I'm pretty sure you knew I would be looking at the manifesto. Yes, I, I actually assured myself, and a couple of things. I caught the 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 shootings as the, well, not as they were occurring, because I never saw the stream, but I did catch it the night of it because I I was I was watching I was watching popcorn. And then I switched to uh, CBS N, and they had a feed from TV3. Mm -hmm. And then I so I went to the computer and started recording it. TV3 is an Australian local channel, and there's the, and they had these. They didn't even play CBS N. It was just the feed from Australia. And so I, I managed to get a few kind of interesting clips. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them were that great. Well, but I, a couple I of a couple of, of observations as this started. Um. The first memes we saw, and with memes, I mean stuff that really went viral, uh, was it? I think it was even a graphic that showed the, the the four steps you have to take when a tragedy happens. You know, don't immediately start report. It was it was almost something that would have been handed out to journalists. You know, the first information is not always correct. You know, better to report correctly than than fast. And this was be this propagated very quickly. The next thing I saw was, and typically when, even if the person is known only through a social media account, they'll say, all right, the guy's name was Brenton Tarrant. Typically, they'll have his middle name in there, Brenton mm -hmm, Tarrant, which I think this guy has. It's like Hugh or something, whatever it is. But they didn't. It was continuously the uh, alleged shooter identifies as Brenton Tarrant on social media. It was something different. I'm not saying there's anything nefarious to it, but I thought that was interesting that the media reported that differently. And then came the part that bugged me the most. As I had already received a, a full video copy, offline video copy of the streaming video, uh, and uh, multiple copies of said manifesto, the great replacement, um, everyone was saying, don't share the document. Don't read the document. Don't share his name. Don't share the manifesto. Don't read it. Don't share it. Don't read it. And like, that is so, it, you know how that bugs me. Well, a couple of things. And I'll just say that why. Briefly. began in, Australia, in, in New Zealand because the reporters were saying the same thing. Well, it was Shapiro. They would, they would, do, their, they would do their report. And, and by the way, the New Zealand accent is so, yeah. it's terrible. It, it's harsh. It is really a bad accent. It's very hard to hear what they're saying. But they make a big point. They do the, all this reporting, and they say, and we advise you to not do this, not do that. And yeah. they advise you not to pass information around. Right. But, and, but Ben, uh, ben video, Shapiro this, was number one on this. Do not use links to the video. Oh, yeah, another thing. Don't use links to the video. But Shapiro was doing this. And, and I don't care what you say. If someone kills people, you know, like Ted Kaczynski, uh, it's – Worth a read. What was he thinking? And to me, and that's where I'll come in. I'm, you have clips. I have a couple things that may add some color. That to me is is the gross uh, atrocity. The second atrocity taking place. We had the killings as the first, and then this literal um, no, yeah, M five M information bomb intended to get a specific response. It's written in the manifesto, and everyone's doing it. So let's get into what you've got, and then we'll circle around to that. Okay. Uh, these are all under the, I think, the massacre subcategory. Yeah. Um, there's a, this was a good one. This is one of those early reports about somebody who was actually there and watching it. This is the massacre man on the street report from TV3. You said there were some Muslims. There were two cars parked here with Muslims in it, and they were just chatting away. They, seemed, they didn't seem to be upset. Um, they certainly were five minutes, ten minutes later, because they come back. So I'm thinking that this guy, um, this was prior to the mosque shooting, because I knew nothing about that. Yeah, do you think he was maybe shooting people in this area before he went down to the mosque, or shooting at people? Well, he didn't, well, I didn't see anybody that he shot, but he certainly discharged his rifle twice that way. I don't know what he was shooting at, whether he was shooting at Muslims in cars, because 
That car had another had another car with yeah, it. And, and viewers can't see, but there's a car just beyond us here, outside of the cordon, yeah. actually, that has been shot out. It has moved. Uh, it may be that police are not aware that he was shooting this far down here. I don't think they're aware that that car even exists, but certainly the motel guy will be because he shot straight in there. And were you able... I mean, we're pretty close here. This is where, you know, how many metres are we talking that you're away from this guy? The width of the road. So three and a half there... The five, four metres, five metres. Four metres, so you could see into his eyes. I mean, what? Oh, yeah, he was, he was a European guy, thick set. I told the police this. Uh, it was hard to pick his age because he had a complete um, cover, his, like the outside of his face, like a SWAT guy. Um, uh, and a bit of a reflection on the window, but uh, yeah, he was definitely a European of thick set build. Um, and that's why I thought he was a. I thought he was a tactical, you know, sort of guy. And looking back now, you didn't know at the time, but no. he has clearly been targeting Muslims. Yeah. Uh, he's killed um, 30 of them uh, just down the road here. Do you think that he didn't want to kill you? Because he obviously had an opportunity to kill you. This is well, this he, is he, this is a man who's killed 30 people that you've come face to face with. Well, obviously, with. if I walked out here and looked like a Muslim, um, you know, with my head done up or whatever, he probably would have shot me. But, I mean, I, I looked like a Kiwi bloke or an Aussie bloke. Um, I meant him no harm because I didn't understand what was going on. Um, but had he pointed a gun with me, I, I would have high tailed it. Trust me, I don't care who he is. You know, yeah, a gun's I, a gun, but he was I'm, reloading. I'm in- he was reloading. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here having a conversation right now. You've just looked a man in the eye out on your front doorstep who's killed 30 people in New Zealand in a terrorist attack, Ross. Oh, I didn't, like I say, I didn't know that at the time. Um, I just thought, you know, we're not used to this sort of stuff in Christchurch, let alone uh, in New Zealand, and it, it takes you by surprise. Yeah, that's not very uh, intelligible for many. I can barely understand half of what he said. He yeah. keeps saying sexy body, but he's not. He's saying something else. Um, and well, I, and I want I want to point out just before we del- delve into it, uh, we're just going straight into deconstruction, so we're not going to waste your time with uh, which. Is, yeah, of course, this is horrible. This sucks. Everyone gets it, and whatever we discuss, not necessarily our opinion. But we just have to go through whatever we see and what we have. Yeah, we're not. Uh, yeah, it was terrible, and it seemed to. And I will say this: the reporters that were on the scene, uh, I've never seen this one guy in particular. Uh, was l- just about to cry and he was shaky mm-hmm. for he was doing a stand up and it was like it, it there was you know it was a horrible situation one there is a intelligence guy named Paul Buchanan who moved to New Zealand from the United States and he worked for the, one of the agencies we don't know which uh and he came on the show Well New Zealand uh, is a part of Five Eyes you know so there's yeah, so, yeah, so there's there's there. spooks there there's spooks there Yeah he may be the spook working there now but he was on the set uh and he was pontificating like a, they expect Americans to do mm-hmm. and I do have three clips from this guy and uh they're pretty short but let's play uh Massacre Paul Buchanan on TV3 The vitriol, the hatred, and in this particular instance, the Islamophobia that comes through in these blogs, and they're not censored, they're not not even monitored as far as I can tell, and they're allowed to get away with it, and then you get that pack mentality going. On the fringes of the pack are people like this. Now, the fact that he has semi-automatic... Oops, they're talking about 8chan and that kind of stuff. Is that so? They're talking about this. I, this I don't fringe. Know. He's talking in general about the unmonitored blogging. Oh, okay. And there's three, I'm going to tell you that I've been advanced to this. I'm going to tell you the three themes that we're going to that I'm going to have some clips that back up. One, they seem to be emphasizing there's nutballs online and they should be stopped. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one is that this was terrorism. Instead of an act of, you know, insanity, it was terrorism and it needs to be defined as such. Okay. And so that came up and that came up over and over again. And then there was, there was a lot less about the guns, you know, gun control, because they already have pretty unbelievable gun control there, which is ironic. Uh, anyway, there was the, there was the getting away with blogging, uh, Blogging without a license is the way I'm looking at it. Uh, the, and then the last one was that this was very comparable to 9-11. Mm. Okay. So anyway, okay. this We're guy back, goes, back to Paul this, Buchanan. Anyway, this guy's, let's skip the rest of that one and go to Buchanan 2. 
Uh, Paul Buchanan is our guest at the moment on a special edition of the project as we try and piece together what happened today and what the future looks like. Paul, how about that issue that Karnor raised? Why isn't the T word being used, the terrorism word? Well, it's absolutely an act of terrorism, and anyone who would say otherwise clearly doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, this was done to intimidate the Muslim community. Uh, in fact, again, I'll, I'll go back to this guy's manifesto. He says he wrote this prior to committing this act. So he outlines why he's doing it. He says he's going to get the foreign invaders out. He's going to put fear into their hearts. He's going to avenge all the European deaths at the hands of Muslims. This was a political act, a political act of violence. There is no way you cannot say it was terrorism. And if you say, oh, he was mentally ill and that, well, one might argue that every act of terrorism is an act of madness. But the point here, it was very political in nature. And uh, so by any definition, narrow or broad, this was a terrorist act. And it, uh, again, it's a watershed moment in our history because it dwarfs anything that has happened to New Zealand in the past. The Rainbow the Warrior. You said New Zealand is now infected. Well, we're infected with this virus of confrontational to the point of homicidal. Hmm. I like that. All right. Do you think this was not a terrorist attack? I have. Uh, yeah, I don't think it was a terrorist attack. I want to read from his manifesto, which surprised me that the journalist uh, cites the document. And by the way, there's a big difference between a manifesto like Ted Kaczynski and this. But I have other things to say about it. it uh, a, about a third of this document is uh, reads like an ask me anything on Reddit. But after it's done, so so you have the question and then the answer, or you could say it looks like an interview. So he questions are asked are highlighted in bold. Question: Do you consider this a terrorist attack? His answer: By the definition, then yes, it is a terrorist attack. But I believe it is a partisan action against an occupying force. Uh, just interesting that the journalists there didn't mention what he what his actual words were. Yeah, that manifesto is really a, a dog. Um, all right, let's go to. Uh, I'm sorry. What do you mean you by have, a, what do you mean by a dog? Well, there's a lot of cut and paste in there that other people have pointed out. Okay, we'll talk about it in a minute. You do your clips because I'm gonna have to disagree. But let's let's get. You through. don't think there's any cut and paste in there? <laughs> Every document is cut and paste. But no, it's, I know. But I mean, he no, was the dog. no, it's not like the compendium of Anders Breivik. That was cut and paste. This is written... Massacre, Paul, three. This is the other one. Intelligence and defense policy analyst. You've had some big days, and I asked you just before we went on air, I said, have you had a big day? And you made a chilling parallel. Uh, yes, this is in terms of uh, uh, what happened as of 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the only thing that I can compare it to is uh, 9-11. Oh, yeah. Uh, not in scale of destruction, but in scale of what how it's spreading and being reported and hopefully changing or with hopes of changing minds and thinking. Yeah. I I think, uh, I think it is equal to that on a media level, but not, uh, not anywhere near destruction. And then we have, uh, the, uh, this is the continuation. This is actually a pre should have been a clip before his, his comments about terrorism but here's massacre tv3 terrorism also uh, a sentiment that's been expressed by many in the muslim community why are we not calling this an act of terror so we will return to you very soon oh that's again why are we not calling it active terrorism i think now, it's easy to why do that is this important uh because it uh, it sets mm, gosh it's a whole different ball game when it's terrorism versus domestic, you know, violence or uh, or mentally ill. I think you know you can go after a group of people with with similar Ooh. ideology. Well, yeah, I think you can. Maybe uh, I think they they they're shoehorning this in there. Uh, here's the way I've been looking at it. this guy was nuts, and he has all the elements of a guy who's nuts. And he does this. He's a re- apparently a Reddit guy, and this is like part of some new thing there. You know, people are doing called shit posting. Uh, 
Well, that's not exactly. (laughs) Go to the No Agenda Reddit. (laughs) That's what they they call themselves shit posters. Yeah. Well, it's because they are. Yeah. But this whole thing is like uh, it's it's almost like real life, real LARPing with a purpose. Uh, Yeah, I'd say for HN is 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 a part of that. uh, I would think that terrorism is to me terrorism is a scheme, and it's not a. You know, you, you could say anything's terrorism if you, you know, you could lift up somebody's skirt walking down the street and then scream at someone. And that's kind of terror. If everything could be terrorism, if you're going to loosen the definition so to an extreme, and but the, the insistence that it's terrorism to me, there's a reason for looks it. Looks as if there's a reason for it being. Why are we? Why do we have to call this terrorism? Why can't we call it one nutball? Why didn't we call uh, some of the sh- school shootings terrorism? Uh, were they, was it terrorism per se, or is it just a lone screwball? The guy who walked into the, into the uh, Aurora Theater and shot it up. Is that terrorism? We could call it terrorism if you were insisting on it, but is it terrorism? And I think this insistence that they call it terrorism, there's something behind it. Well, let's look at, uh, and this has nothing to do with New Zealand, but we can look at Title 22, Chapter 38 of the United States Code. As uh, terrorism is defined as premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational groups or clandestine agents. Okay, so those last two uh, words that subnational think, groups or clandestine agents. Yeah, that that negate this being terrorism. This guy's not a clandestine agent of anybody. And he's not some unless he's uh, unless you're calling him a, an agent of Australia. He's calling himself. Um, he can call himself whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. Would you say he's a member of a subnational group of, no. of white nationalists? No, that's not a subnational what, group? group. Name the group. Uh, it's a white nationalist. There, that is not a group. That's just the definition. That's okay. a that's a vagary. It doesn't. Right. That's so, not a group. So if if they had a name like Proud Boys. Not that they are, but I'm just throwing something out there. That is a named group, then it, then it could be a subnational group? I think it's closer. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just saying, my, the way I'm looking at this, that they're, they're trying to shoehorn this terrorism ah, idea. He, he did call himself an eco-fascist. Consistently, <laughs> consistently. Yeah, yeah. Why? Well, why? <laughs> why is a different question. Um, it's the it's the the guy is like he's screwed. This guy is insane. Yeah, I, I don't think this guy he's is mocking. He's mocking everything, including his own manifesto. It's just like a. It's just no. It's a nonsense document. No, and I have I, I, I have a different opinion. Terrorism thing is a nonsense. Okay, I mean they're trying to make it into a terrorist thing. I yeah. can understand the Muslims thinking that we should do that because you're always blaming us as a group. You're always blaming Muslims as a group of being a bunch of terrorists. If you walk around with a hajib on or anything or a hat, mm-hmm. you're a terrorist Muslim. And so I can see why they're trying to make it look like, well, no, you guys are the worst, worst terrorists than we are. I think it's nonsense. I think the whole thing was an it was a insane incident by some screwball. And that's as far as I can take it. Okay. So I read the document multiple times, marked it up, and have put it in the show notes as I usually do. I think that this, uh, I, I agree with you. I don't think this is necessarily, uh, this guy is the least in- interesting part of the story to me. The document is interesting to me. Uh, and it's not just a cut and paste job. And I, re- you know, I really read through this and I really scoured it. And it immediately, it reminded me of, the Brevik, Anders Brevik, who murdered, uh, what was it like 80, 80 people in uh, was Norway? I saw it long ago, now I've forgotten. But I don't think it was that many, but it was a lot. It was Maybe it was 60. They were on an island, they couldn't get off. <laughs> yeah, but who they <laughs> were, gunman. who who they were was important, because Breivik's enti- his compendium, which is, uh, is a definition of a cut, cut and paste job, his compendium... Uh, specifically stated that he wanted to stop the next generation of left-wing, he may have even said socialist, politicians. And these were young uh, kids of you know, whatever the political party was who were on a retreat, and he wanted to stop them so that he would th- therefore stop the immigration of brown people into his white country. And all of the stuff that he brought up there with... Um, 
the uh, stopping the Ottoman Empire was it 1683 in Vienna, uh, the Crusades. All of this uh, was about the Ottoman Empire invading us, and how could our politicians sell us out? I'm speaking on his behalf. How could our politicians sell us out to allow the Ottoman Empire to still come in and invade our country, <laughs> which is always um, described as a white supremacist, which I don't think Brevik was. Uh, not, white nationalist, yes. And it's the same for this guy. Now, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, this document. And he starts with, you know, with, you know, with some, some scribe, which is not that important. But his introduction, it's the birthrights. And he, he, he says that over and over again. If there's one thing I want you to remember from these writings, it's that the birthrights must change. Even if we were to deport all non-Europeans from our lands tomorrow, the European people would still be spiraling into decay and eventual death. And we, and we know that this is a general theme and... Uh, the reason why I find this uh, interesting to me personally to d- dive into is when I moved back to the Netherlands at the end of the of 99, uh, it was a different country. And the problem that people were talking about was Muslim immigrants and specifically at the time Moroccans. And there was Pim Fortuyn. He was the politician who was saying we have to stop the Islamification. We have to stop. He may have used the invader term. I don't remember that specifically, but he was on uh, on the path to win the the Dutch elections, the political elections with his party, he would become the prime minister. His party won posthumously, but two weeks before he was assassinated. So I saw this, and I saw the the you know people like Taxi Eric. Now he's not a guy who's going to go grab a gun and go kill Muslims, but there is definitely a feeling amongst white Europeans that they're being invaded, and I'm just using that term loosely. So it's not a, a made-up problem. Uh, mass immigration and higher fertility, fertility rates of the immigrants themselves are causing this increase in the population. We are experiencing an invasion on a level never seen before in history. Millions of people pouring across our borders legally, invited by the state and corporate entities to replace the white people who have failed to reproduce, failed to create the cheap labor and new consumers, consumers and tax base that the corporations and states need to thrive. The title of his document, again, is the great, uh, the great replacement, and that's it's on Wikipedia as a conspiracy theory, of course. <laughs> um, the great replacement, le grand replacement en français, is a right wing conspiracy theory, of course, which states that the this is Wikipedia, so take the right wing with whatever grain of salt you want, which states that the white Catholic French population and the white Christian European population at large is being systematically replaced with non-European people. And he goes into the story of his travels and how he tra- how he traveled around France and how he saw that this indeed was taken. Now we don't see this because uh, you know we, we'll see something going on in Paris and you will hear something and we hear about no go zones. But I think you will agree with me that there is a huge Muslim population uh, throughout all of France. Yeah, uh, they have huge, they have large pockets like in La Défense. Lyon, and other, Lyon, is, it's all over. And Lyon, yes, is a big pocket there. So, and uh, they, yeah, it's interesting because the French kind of, uh, meanwhile, of course, the French are having these riots now that are gone completely out of control. Yeah, Nobody just wants to report on yeah, that. Well, you can't, okay, you can't, you can't, you can't switch topics on me like that. No, uh, there may be some connection. So he says, well, he, he traveled and he, he actually explains how he came to this, uh, to this conclusion. But he says, we must crush immigration and deport those invaders already living on our soil. It is not just a matter of our prosperity, but the very survival of our people. And then he goes into this Ask Me Anything, where he had, it's, it's under the heading Answering Possible Questions in General, Who Are You?, um, Ordinary white man, 28 years old, born in Australia into a working class, low income family. My parents are of Scottish, Irish and English stock. I had a regular childhood without any great issues. I had little interest in education during my schooling, barely achieving a passing grade, which was a big, big red flag for me because this document is not just by some moron who barely achieved a passing grade. There's there's a lot of of memes in here and things that are meant to go viral, which are even explained in it. Um 
More recently, I've been working part-time as a kebab removalist. They're very funny. I'm just a regular white man from a regular family who decided to take a stand to ensure a future for my family. And then there are five steps that he hopes to achieve. And the first one, he says, I want to take revenge for the thousands of European lives lost to terror attacks throughout Europe. He even says, actually... And we don't, it's, it's a little difficult for us older guys to understand, but he says, I was traveling as a tourist in Western Europe, France, Spain, and Portugal, and others. The first event that begun to change for him when, when he changed his thinking about invaders, he says, was the terror attack in Stockholm on the 7th of April, 2017. It was yet another terror attack in the seemingly never-ending attacks that had occurred on a regular basis throughout my adult life. We forget. That, you know, the first the first terror attacks, 2001, the guy wasn't even 10 years old, and then he's just seen one after another, after another, after another. Uh, I look at Bataclan, look at Charlie Hebdo. It's not like this doesn't affect young people. This guy is relatively young. You know, you and I have children in this age bracket. So that when he says, I've grown up seeing this, I decide to take a stand. I'm not saying it's great, but I get it. Something that hasn't been a part of my life for as long as I can remember, cynicism in the face of attacks of the West by Islamic invaders was suddenly no longer there. I could no longer bring the sneer to my face. I could no longer turn my back on the violence. Something this time was different. That difference was Abba Ackerlund. And she, this is one of the, the sisters who was mowed down uh, by the stolen van on the shopping promenade. So he has a lot of reasoning behind, I'm just skipping around, a lot of reasoning behind why he's doing this. So here's what he wants to happen. First, I'm doing this to take revenge for the thousands of European lives lost to terror attacks throughout European lands, to take revenge for Ebba Ackerland, and to reduce, directly reduce immigration rates to European lands by intimidating and physically removing the the invaders themselves. So he's saying it right there. I want to intimidate, which I think is terrorism. Uh, To agitate. Intimidation is not terrorism. Okay, I'm not going to. It's fine. It doesn't matter to me. Doesn't. To agitate the political enemies of my people into action, to cause them to overextend their own hand and experience the eventual and inevitable backlash as a result. I think that's, that step one has already taken place. And it's, it's actually it's witnessed here in this montage. Uh, they immediately are overstepping the media, immediately are overstepping their bounds and blaming it on Trump. And... Uh, just so we're very clear what he said about Trump, it was in this question and ask, uh, answer section. It's all about the context. And there's, if you look at a couple questions before, hold on. Here's, um, are you a homophobe? No, I simply do not call to care. I simply do not care at all that much what gay people do as long as they are loyal to their people and place their people's first then i have no issues are you right wing depending on the definition sure are you left wing depending on the definition sure are you a socialist depending on the definition worker ownership of the means of production depends on who those workers are are you a supporter of donald trump as a symbol of renewed white identity and common purpose question mark sure as a policymaker and a leader dear god no are you a supporter of brexit So it's in a list of questions. It's not exactly the way it's being portrayed as, oh, he mentioned Trump. Yeah, symbol of renewed white identity. You ask for God to change people's hearts. Yeah. I have a question for you. Does God need to change people's language? President Trump, uh, whether uh, intentionally or I think in a lot of cases, even inadvertently, has provided a lot of fodder for people like this. Words do have consequences. And we know that at the very pinnacle of power in our own country. You mean the president talking about it? I mean, I know it's hard to even call this out. I've heard this from a guest this morning. Well, this shooter, according to these reports, specifically invoked our president as an inspiration. But you asked Matthew earlier about, is there someone out there tonight who's going to hear Trump's rhetoric and act on it? We know that lots of far-right attackers have claimed to be Trump supporters in recent months. And there's an intolerance that's being spread in this country, in this world, and it comes from the political dialogue. Let's be clear, it comes from political leaders. Words have consequences, like saying we have an invasion on our border. The language he uses 
in this manifesto is all about invaders. It's also language that President Trump used in a campaign ad before the midterm election. Yeah. Why they're uh, seeing inspiration from our own president, John, is you have a president who, when he was a candidate, talked about banning Muslims from entering this uh, this country. So this is a president um, who has given plenty of rhetorical ammunition, I think, to terrorists like this. We need to be mindful in our own rhetoric and in our own actions how we're pushing it. Maybe we need to hear a little less from the president in terms of his, his rather incendiary uh, inflammatory rhetoric on you know, uh, racial or ethnic matters. I know earlier the president tweeted out a message of sympathy to the victims, but the president of the United States need to, needs to go further. So disgustingly, the M5M took this and made it into a screw Trump, it's all his fault. So, uh, the worst line in there was he said, what I think it was Brzezinski, I don't know who said this, that uh, the, the shooter said Trump was his inspiration. Yes. Oh, I heard a lot of these types. There zero evidence of no, that. No, zero. And, but when people would read the portion of, uh, you know, the two lines about uh, Trump, they would always omit, you know, the context of it. And well, they'd also omit the second part. <laughs> yes, the whole second part. Versus God, no, the guy's a disaster. Yes. So... So the guy's talking, this shooter is talking about these three steps. The first one is, you know, make everyone go crazy and overextend. Step two, to incite violence, retaliation, and further divide between the European people and the invaders currently occupying European soil. Yeah, I think that's going to work. Again, and he, he doubles down on to agitate the political enemies of my people into action to overextend their own hand and experience the eventual backlash. And then step three, I believe, this may already have happened, he's very specific about this, to add momentum to the pendulum swings of history, further destabilizing and polarizing Western society in order to eventually destroy the current nihilistic, hedonistic, individualistic insanity that has taken control of Western thought. This is not some dumb line that someone wrote, John. This is, this is, I, don't, I don't know if he wrote it. I don't know. I thought he wrote half of that, but... Uh... Step Keep going. I'm not going to argue about your deconstruction. Yeah. Step four. Finally, to create conflict between the two ideologies within the United States on the ownership of firearms in order to further the social, cultural, political, and racial divide within the United States. This conflict over the Second Amendment and the attempted removal of firearms, firearms rights, will ultimately result in civil war that will eventually balkanize the U.S. along political, cultural, and most importantly, racial lines. And he feels this is good because the balkanization of the U.S. will not only result in the racial separation of the people within the United States, ensuring the future of the white race on the North American continent, but also ensuring the death of the melting pot pipe dream. U.S. involvement in Kosovo shall never occur again, where U.S., NATO forces fought side by side with Muslims and slaughtered Christian Europeans attempting to remove these Islamic occupiers from Europe. Neither you, I, I wasn't really there when this happened in the 90s. Neither you or I can understand how people feel about that. But clearly someone feels something about it. What do you ultimately want, he asks in his Ask Me Anything. We want, we must ensure the existence of our people and a future for white children. There's no supremacy, like and people are less or whatever. He just calls them invaders. Um, I'll go down. Let me see if there's anything else interesting. Why won't anyone do anything? Are you part of any political groups? I'm not a direct member of any organization or group, though I have donated to many nationalist groups and have interacted with many more. Uh, did the groups you support or aligned with Order or promote your attack? No, no group ordered my attack. I made the decision myself, though I did contact the reborn Knights Templar for a blessing in support of the attack which was given. And I believe that is uh, the Anders, Anders Brevik uh, guy. Did you carry out the attack for fame? These are all really good things that the media could report on and maybe should be looked at in schools. I don't know. Did you carry out the attack for fame? No. Carrying out an attack for fame would be laughable. After all, who can remember the name of the attackers and the September 11th attack in New York? How about the attack on the Pentagon, the attackers in the plane that crashed into the field the same day? I will be forgotten quickly. He's got a point there. Uh, 
why did you choose uh, Christchurch and this time? The best time to attack was yesterday. The next best time is today. Oh, great. These little nuggets he throws in there. By the way, we got a note from, we have a lot of producers and some knights in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, here's a note from producer Tristan. New Zealand is pretty tolerant, pretty tolerant place, but has always had an undercurrent of racial tension. It's a colony, and it's the one binding fact of all post-colonial countries. They're built on racial inequality. It's inherent in the modern fabric of the country due to its foundation. Uh, see the film Once We're Warriors for New Zealand, and see the film The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith for Australia. The thing with New Zealand is that it always perceives itself as better than Australia with regards to race relations, but perception is just that. I didn't grow up in New Zealand, but in Australia, so I have an outsider's view of New Zealand. Historically, Christchurch has always been a hot pe- hotbed of white supremacy in New Zealand, with skinhead gangs and hate groups. It's New Zealand's ground zero for that type of thing and has been for decades. Uh, I didn't hear that from anybody. Thought that was I didn't a, hear from TV3 either. No, I thought that was... That's all I heard, because they did have, They interviewed the mayor, and they, and they had everybody that was on, all the hosts of these uh, news shows. They were just going on and on and on and on about how tolerant the New Zealanders are, much more so than pretty much anyone else in the world. <laughs> of course. And multiculturalism lives, yes, yes. and diversity is the <laughs> yes. most important thing in our lives. Yeah. Meanwhile, there are you know there are people there who also have problem with what they think are invaders, regardless of the reality is what they think. Hey, why did you choose New Zealand as a place to attack? Well, New Zealand was not my original choice for the attack. I only arrived <clears throat> to New Zealand to live temporarily whilst I planned and trained, but I soon planned and trained. But I soon found out that New Zealand was as target rich of an environment as anywhere else in the West. Secondly, an attack in New Zealand would bring to attention the truth. of the assault on our civilization, that nowhere in the world was safe. The invaders were in all of our lands, even in the remotest areas of the world, and there was nowhere left to go that was safe and free from mass immigration. You see, beginning to get a a little uh, um, view of what was going on inside the person who wrote this manifesto's head. So we went through the terrorist attack. Now, do you personally hate Muslims? A Muslim man or woman living in their homelands? No. A Muslim man or woman choosing to invade our lands, live on our soil, and replace our people? Yes, I dislike them. The only Muslim I truly hate is the convert, those from our own people that turn their backs on their heritage, turn their backs on their cultures, turn their back on their traditions, and become blood traders to their own race. These I hate. Do you personally hate foreigners or other cultures? No, I spent many years traveling through many, many nations. Everywhere I traveled, barring a few small exceptions, I was treated wonderfully, often as a guest, even as a friend. The varied cultures of the world greeted me with warmth and compassion. I very much enjoyed nearly every moment I spent with them. Um, Did you commit... No, wait. Uh, so is it racist? Uh, see, just and it's 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 worth reading. I'm not going to read every single bit of it, but it's all marked up. Were there other targets planned in your attack? Many. One thing that can be said about the current state of the West is that we live in a target-rich environment. Traitors and enemies abound. Uh, and then, you know, were you a, uh, are you a xenophobe? No. No culture scares me. Are you an Islamophobe? No. Are you a white nationalist? Yes. Predominantly an ethno-nationalist. I place importance on the health and well-being of my race above all else. Are you a Nazi? No. Actual Nazis do not exist. Uh, they haven't been a political or social force anywhere in the world for more than 60 years. Are you an anti-Semite? No. A Jew living in Israel is no enemy of mine so long as they do not seek to subvert or harm my people. Are you conservative? No. Conservatism is corporatism in disguise. I want no part of it. Um, now, here's an interesting, seems kind of odd until you look into some of the documentation. Are you a fascist? Yes. Yes. For once, the person that will be called a fascist is an actual fascist. I am sure journalists will love that. No, because they won't report it. I mostly agree with Sir Oswald Mosley's views and consider myself an eco-fascist by nature. The nation with the closest political and social values to my own is the People's Republic of China. What? (laughs) I'm not quite sure how that fits in, but it's worth mentioning. Well, it's all worth mentioning, but you don't think this guy... No, this, I, this guy is a little sketchy. This, no. this whole manifesto with yes, stuff like that. This guy is 
is irrelevant. I don't think he wrote this. Let's just look at the situation. It was chosen. I don't think he wrote it either. Is chosen at a very specific country for specific reasons. As I just, I'm looking at what happened in the document, not this guy. And I'm not calling it a false flag because it's a very sophisticated operation. The, the the weapons where he has all this writing on them and his heroes and it's the it's the dates of of uh, holding back the Ottoman Empire that was meant to be found. It was meant to show this so people maybe start researching it or thinking about it. It's very obvious. This is a a, a mind bomb. It's to get people to to look at stuff. That that's a possibility. Uh, I want to mention something else. But just about the video for a second. This was very well done. Um, first person shooter view with, I don't know if it was a helmet GoPro or yeah, one on his chest. GoPro. I mean, but it was the angle, everything was just like a video game. I've, uh, I've spoken to kids who have seen it, kids in the 20s who've seen it. Um, actually, kind of underwhelming because it's not as. Um, as it did, doesn't look as violent as a video game does often. And the sound, you know, the, the microphones can't capture the sound of, uh, of something, of a, a weapon like that going off. It just doesn't sound the same as in real life. So it pop, 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 sounds kind of phony. Um, but the way that was done, I would say, was very, very smart and meant to get the attention of young people. I would like to know, uh, well, a couple of things. One, we on this show had predicted that this streaming on Facebook would yes, end up would with end something, in something like bad. Yes. In fact, there was a, I, I got some NPR clips about this too. Um, and they have all kinds of online terrorism experts who, who work at NPR and NBC. I guess they're, they're experts. But let's talk about this streaming. Yeah, what are we going to do? Katie Maceres is a cybersecurity expert, and she says... Oh, she's a security expert, sorry. Perhaps we should consider the possibility that not everyone should be able to live stream. It's not a bad idea to potentially have only specific verified accounts allowed to post. And if something that they post that is live streamed does contain violence or hate speech, that 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 privilege goes away. But she understands oh. that's going to cause a lot of controversy. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine Facebook and Twitter and Periscope saying, all right, you have to be verified now in order to be able to stream. About who is allowed freedom of speech. Look, here's the thing about free speech and free expression. It's a messy proposition, and there's always going to be abuse. Al Tompkins is a senior faculty at the Pointer Institute. He teaches ethics. It's true offline. It's true online. And if you intend to give people the ability to communicate freely with each other, it's going to be messy. And some people are going to abuse it, but most people won't. Twitter and YouTube have both condemned the attacks and said they are working to bring down any video of the shooting. Facebook said in a statement it moved quickly to take down the shooter's Facebook and Instagram accounts and the video. It also said it is, quote, removing any praise or support for the crime and the shooter or shooters. Now, <clears throat> well, wait, stop. What she said at the end there, shooter or shooters, mm -hmm. I want to mention this mm -hmm. just so we can get it out of the way. Yeah. When the reports first started coming in, there were four people, four people. involved in these yeah. shootings. Yeah. And there was at two different mosques. And there, those two mosques weren't very close to each other. Now, that one guy reported off the street saying this guy's driving around shooting randomly at any Muslims he saw, <laughs> which I thought was a little nuts. Yeah. And uh, then he... Uh, went to the one mosque and shot most of the people. And then he went to another mosque and shot a bunch of people. And then over time, <clears throat> the, the two, and it was supposed to be a third. two guys, one hitting the two mosques simultaneously with two partners. And they, in fact, did arrest three men and one woman who were somehow involved. And that's all gone by the wayside. In his document, he speaks specifically about the three mosques he is going to target. He says, I'm going to do the first one, then go to the second one. And if I have time, if I can get away with it, I'm going to go to a third one. So, And that is all spelled out in the document. But this is, you know, I have never really gone in depth on 4chan and 8chan. It's beyond me. It's above me. I'm too old. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm what these people would consider, uh, consider a normie, maybe a hyper normie, because I'm, I can kind of fathom what's going on there. But a lot of massive memes things that become part of our lexicon come from these groups. And it's 
uh, to me, it's very much like, you know, matrixy underground type groups and they lead a different life and they get off on um, uh, having the media being influenced by what they do. So this little section here, where did you receive research or develop your beliefs? He says, the Internet, of course, you will not find the truth anywhere else. That's a 4chan, 8chan sarcastic joke. And all of this is in there. So right after another. Were you taught violence, extremism, and extremism by video games, music, literature, and cinema? And he says, yes, Spyro the Dragon taught me ethno-nationalism. Fortnite trained me to be a killer and to floss on the corpses of my enemies. Uh, no. And then finally, and I, this is how I believe you should read this, is there a particular person that radicalized you the most? Yes. The person that has influenced me above all was Candace Owens. Each time she spoke, I was stunned by her insights and her own views helped me push further and further into the belief of violence over meekness. Though I will have to disavow some of her beliefs, the extreme actions she calls for are too much, even for my tastes. <laughs> you know, and anyone asking why, it's like, it's the part of the same sarcastic joke. It's, yeah. it's, is it's it sarcastic material. Yes. Candace Owens is never. Vi- it's 8chan material. It's 8chan material. Um, and then here, the final step, which I think is the final step of his, his plan. Uh, why do you believe you will be released from prison? I do not expect to be just released. I also expect an eventual Nobel Peace Prize, as was awarded to the terrorist Nelson Mandela once his own people achieved victory and took power. I expect to be freed in 27 years from my incarceration, the same number of years as Mandela for the same crime. There's something to be said for it. Not the way he did it, but... You know, Mandela was involved in some stuff. Wasn't that why they threw him in jail? It was, yeah, it was one of the reasons they threw him in jail. Are you a Fed slash shill slash Mossad agent slash false flag slash patsy slash infiltrator slash Antifa slash glow in the dark, etc.? No, but the next person to attack could be. So a healthy skepticism is a good thing. Just do not allow your skepticism to turn your parano- to turn to paranoia and keep you from supporting those that want the best for you. And I found this is is this your complete writings and views? Unfortunately not. There was a much larger work written, roughly 240 pages. This one is about 80. Um that spoke on many issues and went into much depth, but in a moment of unbridled self-criticism, I deleted the entire work and started again two weeks before the attack itself. I was left with a short period of time to create a new work and only leave my views half finished. I will let my actions speak for themselves. Now, I don't know what that is supposed, why that's in there, but it, you don't delete anything, even off of a hard drive, so if they can retrieve anything, it'd be interesting to see what the... the- he doesn't do anything. It's full of shit, this guy. Uh, and then there's, a, again, this guy is, the guy himself who's in jail, I don't think is important. It's part of a culture that we really don't know anything about. And yeah, I think he's, I was obviously nuts, but it's, there are people behind him who wrote this. And again, it's not a false flag. It's a real operation. Well, false flags are real operations. Right, but it's not like a country or, you know, so who said, oh, let's do this or uh, let's do this. Uh, it's not the government. It's not the government doing this to, to yeah, get We have to remember that we get rid I of think guns. That's a problem with our show and I think the way people look at these things. There's differences between false flags, real operations, real operations that are false flags, and hoaxes where nothing happens and right. it's all bull crap, right. Right. which we've identified a few of those over time but this definitely was not that no and then he has uh, notes to different groups of people he says to conservatives ask yourself truly what has modern conservatism managed to conserve he says uh, the natural environment western culture ethnic autonomy religion the nation the race nothing is, is conserved the natural environment is industrialized pulverized and commoditized he so he hates conservatives conservatives and then to Christians, he posts two passages from the Bible, which I don't recognize and are not Marx, so I don't know where they're from. To Antifa, Marxists, and communists, I do not want to convert you. I do not want to come to an understanding. 
egalitarians and those that believe in hierarchy will never come to terms. I don't want you by my side, and I don't want you to share power. I want you in my sights. I want your neck under my boot. See you on the streets, you anti-white scum. And then to Turks, and he's very specific about, and this comes right back to Constantinople, which is today's modern Istanbul. Turks, you can live in peace in your own lands and may no harm come to you. On the east side of the Bosporus, which is the traditional divide, where we have the devout uh, Islamists and then the, it used to be secular on the, on the western side. He goes on to say, if you attempt to live in the European lands anywhere west of the Bosphorus, <coughs> the Bosphorus, we will kill you and drive you roaches from our lands. We are coming for Constantinople. We will destroy every mosque and minaret in the city. The Hagia Sophia will be free of minarets and Constantinople will be rightfully Christian owned once more. This is the at one point was the largest um, I think it was, it was the cathedral, the Hagia Sophia, uh, which was a Christian run, and then it became a uh, a mosque. And so I guess that's a, an important uh, symbol for guys like this. And who is truly to blame? The people who are to blame most are ourselves. European men, strong men, do not get ethnically replaced. Strong men do not allow their culture to degrade. Strong men do not allow their people to die. Weak men have created this situation, and strong men are needed to fix it. And then he has a whole list about um, Wikipedia links of European women invaders, the rape of European women invaders. And it's more than just Rotherham. If you look at the list, it's got uh, Rotherham, Aylesbury, Banbury, Bristol, Derby, Halifax, Huddersfield, Cayley, Newcastle, Rochdale, Oxford, Peterborough. This is the stuff that Tommy Davidson went to jail for, for talking about this. This is all mainly British uh, British places. Then we have Ashfield, Sydney, Finland. Uh, so this is not a cut and paste. He's showing all the different places where this is happening. The, he talks about the radicalization of Western man, about the pedophile rings, the failure of assimilation, Green nationalism, he says, is the only true nationalism. There is no green future with never-ending population growth. The ideal green world cannot exist in a world of 100 billion, 50 billion, or even 10 billion people. Continued immigration into Europe is environmental warfare and ultimately destructive to nature itself. So interesting alignment with, uh, with the greenies there. And then he does call for the death of certain people, which has also not been mentioned. And I think you know, it's in the document. And he says, look, you can do TATP packages strapped to drones, uh, in motorcycle saddlebags, you can convoy ambush, well, ramming. This is the reason they don't want people talking about the document, perhaps that particular. I entry. don't even think they read this fair, John, this far. I don't think they ever even saw it. No. Well, well if, it's, if it's our media, that's for sure. Well, let's see who needs to die. Uh, Merkel. The mother of all things anti-white, anti-Germanic, is top of the list, he says. Few have done more to damage and racially cleanse Europe of its people. Erdogan, the leader of the oldest enemies of our people and the leader of the largest Islamic group within Europe. He's very specific. This warlord must bleed his last while he visits his ethnic soldiers currently occupying Europe. His death will also drive a wedge between the Turk invaders currently occupying our lands and the ethnic European people while simultaneously weakening Turkey's hold on the re- region. Well, let's just read the list. I don't need all the details. Sadiq Khan, mayor of London. Uh, well, it's just the usual suspects. Yes. And, yeah. then, and then he says, and we can leave it at this, the paradox of the diverse equality. The greatest joke of all is the quixotic, quixotic foolishness of the diverse but equal society. Diversity. Yeah, that, I re- read that sentence, and I think the use of the word quixotic what by is, a guy what is, like this what, oh, is yeah, extremely no way. unlikely. I don't even know what it means. Quixotic refers to Don Quixote and the, uh, oh, the, the, the you know, shaking the t- your fist t- at Tilting at windmills. Okay. Well, here he's, so this, he may have gotten this from somewhere else, but he says diversity by its very definition belies equality. No two different things can ever truly be equal, especially humans. There is no one person equal to any other, not identical twins, not countrymen, not workers within a class group, and certainly not those of different races. Every human is worth only their own value, no more or less. The more diverse a group becomes, the less equal it becomes. Diversity is anathema 
to equality. One cannot exist, exist with, uh, with the other, which is yeah. true. All right, so... Well, I don't know whether that's true or not. Well, diversity and equality much. in people, you, you can't... I agree with it, that. It's philosophical. It could be argued every which way forever. Mm-hmm. Let me see I'm just not buying this guy. I mean, this, this, everything you read just doesn't sound like this, like any, like this, who this guy is. He's a high school dropout using the words like quixotic, and then he's, mm-hmm. he's philosophizing about diversity versus equality. I yes. mean, this is stuff of, uh, yeah, this, you know, very high end yes. intellectuals that sit around bitching or bitching. What am I saying? Uh, discussing <laughs> these topics. Yes. Uh, using all kinds of, it's just, it's, 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 this thing is very, uh, it's, I, I think it's going to be shown that this guy either didn't even travel around Europe. This guy, but again, John, I'll just repeat it. This guy is not, this document is not this guy. We're, we agree on that. So whatever they, while everyone's focusing on this guy, this thinking is out there. This thinking is not him in a in a vacuum. This thinking is amongst people. Not the the killing and the death, but the no, I am not despair. Argue. Obviously, this thing is out there because somebody put that document together, whether it was him or whoever. Exactly. But it it's not. Uh, it, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff in that document that is something to be concerned about. Yes, and especially when he starts using code. The tone of this document is all about the Internet. Uh, he writes it in this sort of snarky adolescent style, uh, and especially there's this lengthy self-interview he does, sort of imagining what the media might ask him. It's really self-important, but it's also full of all these winking references to Internet memes, and it's very self-aware. At, at one point, he even says that his racist project uh, relies on, quote, edgy humor and memes in the vanguard stage in order to attack, attract uh, young people. Can you give us an example of that? Well, uh, probably the one everyone's talking about is how uh, when he was streaming live video during his attack, uh, right at the start, he says, subscribe to PewDiePie. And now that sounds bizarre to the average grown-up, but uh, you need to understand that PewDiePie is this Swedish video game playing YouTube star, and his crown as the most subscribed to person on YouTube had been threatened by another YouTube account out of India. So for a lot of people, or some people, subscribe to PewDiePie is sort of internet code for supporting white Europeans. <laughs> so, well, I suppose you could make that interpretation. <laughs> well, but but it's it doesn't really matter because the interpretation, that's NPR. This is the interpretation that's being made. So what I see happening is a meme-filled document which is being che- which is meant to be cherry-picked from it's set up that way is it's it's happening and it's delighting people who um have this similar invader belief but when it's described on television as crazy white supremacists don't read the document this should be discussed and explained in schools because it's very easy for these children any child to fall into this and i consider anyone under 30 eligible for this kind of bull so it i'm, I'm well, i am concerned about and that, that is probably the fourth meme to come out of this besides it's a 9 11 uh blog should be uh, monitored and blog should be licensed and uh it's terrorism or why isn't it terrorism i think the the, the fourth meme coming out of this is the is this don't read the document. Yeah, here's a, well, uh, here's the online terrorism expert from NBC, and he's on NPR. And, of course, he knows how. Yeah, he really understands what's going on. It has nothing to do with the document. See, it's, uh, no, it's Silicon Valley. Did you say really recommend, re- recommendation algorithms? What exactly is that? Yeah. Oh, sure. So, say oh, you, sure. You know, sure, 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 sure. There it is. Sure, sure, sure. sure, sure. sure. Like, hey, like, sure. Like, yeah, like. sure. Sure, 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 sure. Did you say really recommend, what, recommendation algorithms? What exactly is that? Yeah. Oh, sure. So, say on YouTube. You know, you're looking at a YouTube video, and there's a thing on the right sidebar. It auto plays yeah. afterwards, right? It just gives you another right. video after the fact right. just to keep things moving, right? Right. right. Uh, a lot of extremism groups have gamed this system as a way to try to get their uh, outreach um, through through YouTube and Facebook as well. And what they'll do is they'll just they'll take these these ideas that will slowly sort of seep into your idea that maybe you should become more militant. Maybe it's not acceptable that you know that immigration is at highs in your country or something like that and then oh, they see. say You're saying eventually this, this, to act on it yeah this guy could have i mean obviously we don't, we don't know a lot at this point but someone like this could be radicalized in that way if they were active on sites like that 
Oh, absolutely. And there's, it, it, we've seen this over and over again. We've seen this with the synagogue shooter in the United States as well, where he's in these spaces. This guy was on 8chan. That's where he posted his um, his uh, manifesto and his link to, and the link to the live stream as well. That's how the p- people sort of found it and started watching it in real time. 8chan is uh, a message board that's effectively like an, extreme, an extremist message board. It's extremely anti-immigrant, extremely racist, and completely anonymous unless you out yourself like this guy did. Um, once you're all the way down that path, it's really hard to turn back. And that's, that's the other thing is that these companies really don't take the steps in time to get people who are, you know, not that dangerous to stop them from getting all this content in their system and, you know, drumming up fears within themselves and then eventually carrying out a racist terror attack. Okay, so what these morons don't understand is that places like 4chan and 8chan, they're not like companies, you know, necessarily... Uh, and it doesn't matter. You can take it down. You can take it all down. The Internet is a network and can and will be utilized by anyone who wants to communicate. In fact, you're, you're having an adverse effect by taking these places down and, and removing people from speech. And uh, I see I already see in the troll room like, oh, who, what idiot will read this and get radicalized? I think uh, more than you would even dare imagine. It's, you know, it's really, it doesn't take much when you see the changes that young people up to 30 have witnessed in Europe. I can't speak for, the U.S. is different. We're an immigration country. We, this is what we are, is who we are. You know, the argument of of people coming in illegally is different from we don't want people, which is what Trump is always uh, uh, accused of is not true. But in Europe, these are not traditional immigration countries. We had guest workers in every country, and this is now, by many, perceived to be an invasion. Living in some shitty-ass town in France or the Netherlands or Belgium or England, and then all of a sudden your entire street view changes is uh, not to be taken lightly. And then you add some of this stuff, and you add some historical stuff about the um, the the Vatican, uh, the the Vienna, and the Ottoman Empire, and the and the Crusades, and the Knights Templar, and it's not hard to get an imaginative young person to say, "Hey, wait a minute!" And you take this document; it should be dissected, deconstructed, and spoken with about people in schools, because if not, they're going to interpret it in very uh, in ways that will cause more violence. And so, fuck you, media, for doing the what you're doing. Blame it on Trump. That is the worst. That is exactly the wrong way to go, and it's kind of what this guy's hoping for, or whoever wrote this group. I'll say it's a group who wrote this document. Yeah, well, blame it on Trump. Sadly.